studio with uh, the mogul, Delegate Michael Hornby. Good to see you, Rob. Appreciate you coming in here today after making the long drive back from Charleston, passing bills. Had to give up a lot. Getting the work done. A little inside joke there. Yeah. <laughs> Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matthew Harvey. Good morning. Good morning. And a very friendly face who brought in some very delicious <laughs> treats and goodies. <laughs> Amy Orndoff from Berkeley Senior Services. Amy, good morning. Good morning, guys. What oh. is in this lovely pink box here? I don't know. I have to open it and find out. It says crumble on it. It's a pizza. Yeah. No, it's not a pizza. I, 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 I would be the person to do that, yeah. by the way. It is, Breakfast pizza. looks like designer cookies. <laughs> Anybody that yes. would go to the commons for you oh is obviously, that's, that's act, brave. obviously loves that you a lot, is. Rob. Just to get in and out. <laughs> to get in and out, you must have gone really early. Or to, really late. Or really, really late, yeah. yeah. They're open till 11. <laughs> <laughs> 11 o'clock? That's, that's the only way to avoid traffic getting in and out of there. Well, Aim, good morning. Good morning. We've been setting this interview up here for about two months, I think. Maybe we have. three. Maybe we have. three. I've, I've been putting shameless plugs everywhere I could about this book. So <laughs> Yes. So you didn't write it, though. <laughs> I did not. I, I cannot take any credit for it at all other than just being a prattful daughter. All right. So uh, can you hand me a copy of that? Right oh, there yeah. in, in the middle? Yep. You got it, Mike? Okay. Mike's got it up on oh, his. Okay. There you go. There. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> all right. Murder always gets it right. I'm going to yes. let you see when I have Gil Strip on, he, he brings us authors from all over the world, right? I right. always let him introduce the authors. Okay. And I would prefer you introduce this author. I can definitely do that because this author is someone very <laughs> near and dear to my heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a daddy's girl, um, the my dad is, is the author of this book, and it's been a long time in the making. And um, my dad has and is always been very incredibly creative and this book is just one small snippet of his uh, level of creativity and i will share with you when i was little and even when my kids were little they could draw just scribbles on a piece of paper and my dad would look at it and then just make a beautiful picture out of it so that's just the level of his creativity and it's very much expressed in his writing and his name is? His name is Jeff McDaniel. Besides dad? Is, besides dad. It's hard to introduce your father as anything other than dad. <laughs> it is. Dad, right? It is. It is. <laughs> well, you know, I, I could never call him Jeff, but it is Jeff McDaniel. <laughs> it's a difficult uh, thing to it put. It is. Yeah. Jeff slash dad, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. What's the Jeff McDaniel story? Well, Jeff McDaniel was uh, raised here, and I'm a Musselman High School graduate, uh, class of 1975, once an Appleman, always an Appleman. Mm -hmm. uh, did you play football there by chance? I, yes, I did. 74 so state title team. Yes, yeah. I, I'm so well and a, done, and a, daughter. And well again, done. And again, I'm going to put a shameless plug. In a few weeks, he will be inducted into the Musselman Hall of Fame. Oh, sweet. So, yes. Very yes. nice. Thank you very much. That was, uh, what, what year did Denny Price start coaching? Denny Price, uh, his first year was an assistant coach, and that was my sophomore year in 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bob Kaminsky was the head right. coach. Then uh, Coach Kaminsky left, came to Martinsburg, and Coach Price took over in 1973. And um, by 1974, uh, the football world was just went crazy because we won the Class A 1974 state championship. Which was the first football championship won by an Eastern Panhandle team. Yes, it was. And uh, we had three great coaches. And one thing – Back uh, then were there – Multiple levels, A, double A, triple A? Yes, sir. And Musselman yeah. was a, a single A school we, back we then? We were a single A school. <laughs> at, yeah. Imagine that. Not, it, right? And, and we were a small single A school. And uh, we played three triple A schools, four double A schools. And we were part of the Bi-State Conference. And so we played a lot of Maryland schools and such. But uh, we, you know, had a, a, a great season. And I believe, I, I hope I'm correct in saying this, that is the only year that Coach Price, we practiced for two weeks, three times a day. We went from 8 to 11, we went from 1 to 3.30, and then we went from 6 to 8, or 8.30. Now, it was, you know, uh, before school started in early August. And uh, we had a, a lot of players going into that, and when we came out of those two weeks of three days, <laughs> there was 23 of us left. So um, That's a tough 23. It, it was, but we had three outstanding coaches. Uh, coach Denny Price, obviously the head coach, and he was at Musselman 40 years. Uh, coach Jerry Horner. Great guy. Great guy, fantastic football coach. And um, Coach Bill Riggleman, mm -hmm. which um, – 
he passed away several years ago and uh, all three men were I, I i'm going to say this very quickly and then i hope we talk about a book sure <laughs> <laughs> i want to but, hear who you played at that in the playoffs that year uh they in a, in those days only four schools went so it was very very difficult we went in uh the ninth after the ninth week we were number nine in the state but we played triple a williamsport and that was a year williamsport had won i think they were eight and eight and one and uh, the, the way the playoff system, you guys know how that works mm -hmm. with bonus points. Well, they were AAA, and they had won a lot of games. So no one was counting Musselman. Well, Coach Price and then Principal uh, Kenneth Waldeck actually went to the meeting. And I got this story from Mr. Waldeck, the principal, that they sat there for several hours. And all the teams were talking about all playoff possibilities, but Musselman was never mentioned. And they said, uh, Mr. Waldeck said, and they said, well, if there's nothing else, and said, Coach Price stood up and said, my name is Denny Price. I'm the head coach of the Musselman Appleman. And when we beat Williamsport on Saturday, we're going to be at least number four, number three. And there's not a thing any of you all can do about it. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Mr. Waldeck said, everybody started, where is Musselman, West Virginia? I mean, they didn't even know mm -hmm. that, you know, it was in Inwood, Bunker Hill, slash Bunker Hill and such. But, uh, and we went over and we uh, trailed at halftime. And um, I think we were down 14 to nothing at halftime. And Coach Price, uh, very calm, came in. And we were, you know, waiting for this big, you know, and he just, he very calm and said, we just got to quit making mistakes because you're better than they are. And we went out, tied the game with three minutes to play and beat them in overtime. And uh, the rest was history. But, but then we played uh, Mannington High School. Um, in the first round of the playoffs and then for the state title we beat hamlin high school and the head coach of hamlin high school was coach price's roommate when they were in college oh. so uh that was uh you know uh, extra for for coach price but it put musselman on the map it uh you know it kind of catapulted uh 40 years of greatness of musselman football under coach price and uh but i, I want to say this to that uh, I've told, I think, all three of the coaches, they were teaching us more than football. You don't realize it, but Denny Price, Bill Riggleman, and Jerry Horner, they were teaching us how to be men. And uh, football was just the vehicle they used, uh, you know, to, to do that. But they were great role models, along with uh, Mr. Waldeck, um, it was great to be an Appleman in the 70s for the leadership that you had in the school. And uh, it was it was a great time to be alive. It yeah. really, really yeah. was. And I'm sure some of that discipline carried over when you decided to write a book. Well, uh, about uh, murder. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I, I uh, it's funny because when I started this journey, I had this story in my head for a long time. And, uh, I, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know. Uh, we had to go back to Tennessee. My father-in-law had taken ill, and my wife and I, we, we had, this is our second tour in Tennessee. So long story short, I, I, you know, we had retired. I wasn't doing anything. I thought, you know, I'm going to start seeing if this goes anywhere. And as I started writing, I thought, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, and I, I had a couple people read it, and, and my brother Mike said, who's an avid reader, he said, hey, this is good. <laughs> and I said, you know, okay. That's pretty you know. good from a brother. Yeah. That's it must be really good. And, and How I long said, did it take you to write it? Uh, I, I had an interruption in between uh, taking that the interruption away. It took me about nine months okay. to get this one. Now, my second book is due to come out. Um, it's called Stills, Pills, and Murder. And I hope to have it. Uh, it's obviously about moonshine <laughs> in Berkeley County, Frederick County, Virginia, and the surrounding areas. And... Uh, you will have no idea what I unearthed when I studied the moonshine <laughs> mm -hmm. in Berkeley County, West Virginia. I mean, it's a rich history. Yeah. Oh yes, it's very rich. And uh, they found out that corn was worth more money in liquid than it was a solid mm -hmm. and such. But uh, I, I, I was not a, a great reader uh, growing up. My brother was. Uh, so when I started reaching out looking for publishers. I got asked a question, said, well, who is your favorite author? And I said, well, I don't have one. And they said, oh, everybody's got a favorite author. I said, I, I, I don't have one. And the, the said, you want me to publish your book and you don't even read? I said, well, I wouldn't go that far, but I spent, I'm a retired high school history teacher, government teacher, and I, I read those kind of books. And he said, give me some. I said, Mark Twain. 
He said, well, if you're going to go, go big. That's, that's what <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, put it together and... Uh, uh, say Arthur Fonzarelli. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Different Arthur. <laughs> Different Arthur. That's yeah. good. I'm going to write that down. That's pretty... But uh, the book, uh, like I said, took about nine months, and uh, I reached out to uh, several publishing houses and, and things like that, and... Uh, there are three ways to publish, and I took option three, which has been around about 20 years of self-publishing, where it, uh, I'm actually, you know, I have a publisher, but they help guide me through uh, formatting. Uh, the easy part is the writing part. The yeah. difficult part is the formatting, the cover design, and everything like that. And then, of course, marketing, which I find is kind of fun mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh how have you marketed your book well um i have you're you're my first live interview uh i've got a book signing tomorrow or excuse me i have a book signing saturday at 11 o'clock in old town winchester down on the uh, they call it the walking mall mm -hmm. at the winchester book gallery i'll be there at 11 o'clock saturday to one doing a book signing with them uh there are several other um uh, bookstores that we're talking with of trying to get in and such. Um, I'm uh, negotiating with uh, Books A Million, trying to get it in there. I, I don't know how, I mean, I'm waiting for some, some things back on that. But the, uh, the, the book's doing very well on Amazon.com. Uh, and I have a website. Uh, if you go to www.jeffmcdanielauthor.com, you can read the fr uh, chapter one for free to get an idea if it's something that you would like or not. And here in a few weeks, I'll have uh, book two. I'll have chapter one on my website. And if you sign up for um, to be on my mailing list on that website, um, we'll send you updates of, of new releases, things like that. I've got... Uh, I'm researching a third book now. I'm writing the second book. It's about 75% finished. Then it'll go to the uh, editors, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> if you've ever had a book edited, that is uh, there's a lot of fun with that. Uh, um, but uh, they're an important part. Uh, Does it the, remind the you of three a days? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Honestly, Coach Price, if you're listening, I, 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 I don't have much. I'm 67 years old, but I'll I'll do as many grass drills as I can, which will probably be one. I'd rather do that than go through the editing. I really would. Uh, that's physical. The editing uh, is uh, mental and emotional and such. But um, no, I, I've enjoyed the process. I enjoy writing. All my life, I've been a storyteller. And as a school teacher, I'm a retired school teacher. I taught 10 years at Heather Ridge Alternative School in Frederick, Maryland. I had Bloods, Crips, MS 13s in my classroom together, which was an adventure. Uh, and uh, the key word in an alternative school is alternative. You got to come up with an alternative way to teach. I'm a storyteller. So I would, you know, we would uh, work things out and, and it worked. It worked for me. So this just seemed to be, with retirement and everything, this seemed to be a natural segue for me to, let's write, let's see where it goes. And uh, I'm real happy. The book uh, was for, uh, released on July the 30th. Sales have been pretty good and such, but just trying to get you know, more out. Well, Jeff, and, what's, what's a good goal for a first-time book publishing in terms of number of sales? Um, what's reasonable? I mean, I'm sure you'd love to sell a million copies, but what's what's a reasonable yeah, amount? Well, the first million I sold, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I'm averaging about 100 a month, mm -hmm. and I've told that that's actually high. That's great. So it, it is uh, the first month, I think, was like 82, and uh, and that was on Amazon. That did not count the ones that I've sold, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. people that know you and things like that. Um, How many has your daughter bought? Uh <laughs> Zero. Don't put me on the spot, Mike. <laughs> now, well, I, I, I gave her one. I know that. I you should have charged her. <laughs> yes, now, I, his granddaughter did buy one, but I'm go. not going to say which granddaughter <laughs> because I'm not throwing my kids under the bus. But. Smart. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, if you can be somewhere around 50 to 100, I, I think, it, you know, that's not. And the, the thing I'm happy with is that the sales have grown each month. Mm -hmm. Now they're not growing as fast as I would like them, but uh, <laughs> but they are increasing. So I think that it is a rising needle, and that's a, that's a positive thing. But well, I you're you're your own PR team if you self-publish. Well, it, you are and you're not. There's three methods. The old method was you typed up a manuscript, you sent it 
unless your name was John Grisham, Patricia Cornwell, it sits on a shelf. And you can still do that. Then you had the other end that's called vanity publishing, which means I could write the label off a of Campbell's soup can. If you pay for it, they'll publish it. About 20 years or so ago, when the internet really began to boom, they found out that you can do like a self-publishing where you're in a partnership with them. And I highly recommend it, but I will say this, when you research for self-publishing, be careful because there's a lot of sharks in the water. Uh, but what I did is I found a publisher that uh, was very real. I said, look, let's be honest. If I've got the money, you're going. He said, "No, I won't." He said, "We only pub, we only sign contracts with about a third of people we talk with." And I said, "I'm taking you at your word." And he said, "I'm taking you at yours." And I thought, "Okay, I like this guy." <laughs> and and he he was right. But with the self publishing, it's it's a school in, in a sense. You know, I put up money up front, but I own this book. I have 100 percent of all royalties, but. The partnership with them is they took care, they did this cover design. I didn't have to pay for that. They did the formatting. When we got ready to launch, I had a launch team. They helped mm. me launch the book. They, okay. they, they got the I, IBSN numbers for mm -hmm. me and things like that. So did all that. Print, did they print the book too? Uh, no. Actually, this book is printed uh, that I've got here. Uh, it's actually Amazon prints this. Amazon does. Yes, they do. And I, oh. I don't know how they could possibly do that, but it. Dale. Well, Jeff, uh, I'm going to jump in here too because we have uh, five minutes left. What's the plot of Murder Always Gets It? Well, it's a it's set in 1931 Winchester and Martinsburg. Um, my main character is named Ambrose Ford. He is a, a very wealthy man. He's 30 years old. He's a George Washington University graduate. He is lives in Boston. He has a tragedy in 1928. And you know, when we deal with tragedies, we do it one of two ways: it's fight or flight. He decides he can't fight it anymore. He had been in Winchester in 19, uh, the very first Apple Blossom as a student at GW. He liked it. He moves to Winchester, opens a detective agency, and he's met with, uh, son, you ain't from here. So it's hard to find work. He takes a case nobody else wants. It's a missing person case. And the more he digs into it, he realizes that um, the, the plot thickens, and it's like anything else. You, you're finding... Uh, additional murders and the police are you know the the, the first murder is kind of a, a shady character so you gotta also keep in mind 1931 is the second and almost third year of the Great Depression they're not so worried when a, a nobody gets killed and they're like so uh, Brody is his name Ambrose is it uh, Brody he takes us on as he's looking for this missing person He's finding out, and there's also teenagers coming up missing in the Winchester, missing in the Winchester area. So the book goes on for that. Uh, people ask me about the title. Said, "Boy, that's a crazy title." When you read the book, you understand the title. So read the book. <laughs> Is this based on anything that uh, happened? No, sir. It, the, the historical parts are very accurate. The, the street names, the towns, uh, and such as that. I've researched. Uh, I knew a lot of the local history and such, but um, I, I, it, historically, if you find something wrong in the book, I, I was a history teacher, I never said I was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is it set 90 years ago? Why did you choose that time period? Because when I was at Muslim High School, in 1973, we had a teacher there, uh, Joanna Snyder, and anybody that hears this that, that knows Miss Snyder, she was the greatest. She turned me on to history. Well, the history class I had was her, was the Great Depression in that era, and I remembered it, and I just kind of fell in love with it. It's a great time, and it's it's a horrible great time in American history because you had the Dust Bowl going on and different things. I like that era, and also I own a 1930 Model A Ford. Sweet. So I'm going to try to find a way to get that book in this, or get the car in this book. But I haven't. But I like that that period, and um, it, it just I think it was it was a horrible time to be alive, but a great time to be alive because. Uh, the resiliency and the 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 power of man mm -hmm. was 
was demonstrated of how these people got through, and which will be in my second book. Like I said, they found out that corn was worth a lot more in liquid yeah. than, uh, but that was a survival thing. It was so. an amazing generation of people. You survived the Depression. You walk right into World War II. You come out of that with Korea, and then you got the Kennedy assassination in Vietnam. Is the things these, then you land on the moon, the things that these people experienced in their lives. A absolutely. And uh, I, you know, I'm 67 years old. And I used to, as a, as a boy, I would listen to the stories and was just fascinated with the, the people that came through. My mother-in-law back in Tennessee, she's 93, years, she celebrated her 93 or 93rd birthday Tuesday. She was a child of the Depression. She grew up in Arkansas. She talks about being, you know, not having shoes, having to pick cotton. You know, she was five years old, six years old, picking cotton during the Depression as a child. And I can't imagine, but yet she tells those stories with a smile because yeah. she, she talked about the love of her family in Arkansas and, you know, and what it was like to be there. So I, I just always been fascinated with history and fascinated with this time and the time of it. Uh, the book is called Murder Always Gets It. Uh, Jeff, how much, we have 20 seconds. How much is the book? The book is fifteen ninety five, uh, available in paperback or ebook on Amazon. And we are working on getting... Uh, an audio, but we don't have the audio out yet. 